All right, well, I have moved uh, down the Sacred Way a little bit, a little bit closer to Verdun. And as we've mentioned in previous episodes, the city of Verdun was a fortress city. There was a ring of forts all around this place. And uh, we're visiting one now called Fort Regret, which is pretty wild. As a matter of fact, it's on a military installation. So uh, we have a friend named Lauren who is... Uh, helping us out <laughs> and uh, has access uh, to the sports. We're gonna go in and uh, yeah, kind of get off the beaten path a little bit today. Uh, we just got inside the the walls of the fort here and I can already tell that I'm really gonna like this place being a bunker junkie um, like I said access to this place is limited because it's a military installation uh, but anyway have uh, like I said a French guide named uh, I'm, I'm gonna say the name wrong uh, my, my French is terrible uh, anyway we're, we're gonna kind of do some exploring he's gonna tell a little bit about the, the history of this fort in the front of the door, you can see two dates. The first one is the uh, first date of the, the first date of the construction of the fort, and the second one is when they built all the concrete barrack in defense of the fort. Uh, there is two periods because of in uh, 1895 there is a new munition, new explosive which arrived and it's uh, uh, the forts which was built the first time in stone were not enough strong to resist from the new uh, munition mm. so they built uh, in regret they built a concrete uh, barrack near the first uh, stone barrack that we call the modernization of the the forts it's um, the, the name of uh, this period was um, La Crise de l'Obus Torpille. And so the, some fort was just finished when the crisis came. Uh, in Regret, it wa there is two barracks, stone barrack and concrete barrack, in Vaux and Douaumont they build concrete on the stone barrack. That was the re reinforcement they, they did. Here in Rurgri there is the two sides, stone and uh, concrete. We will go to see the stone in the first time. All right, what we're looking at right here is the original entrance into the fort. So soldiers would have come in from the outside and then come in right here, uh, right into the barracks. Uh, after the improvements in the early 1900s, well, they shifted the entrance. And uh, this used to be bigger, but um, whenever they built the concrete portion, they, they walled this off and narrowed it off a little bit. All right, we're moving into the fort now. And uh, something that's kind of interesting, if you look at this part right here, you can see that it's all concrete. It wasn't concrete originally, though. Originally, there was a wooden bridge that would be 
uh, going across here. The reason being, if the enemy happened to penetrate the outer wall, well, they would raise this bridge up and there would be like a, a moat right here that would be very difficult to, to cross. But uh, yeah, pretty interesting. Okay, making our way uh, into the interior of the fort here. And uh, as Loren was uh, just telling me, there were two different phases of construction of the fort. The first phase in the 1870s was much smaller, of course, and then uh, it expanded out. What we're looking at here is some of the original construction, uh, which was made of stone, and then there was an expansion later on. So anyway, we're, we're gonna go inside the barracks here and uh, take a little look around. This area right here is where the bakery for the fort would have been located. Uh, now, originally, all of this sand right here was up on top to help contain the heat in the oven. And uh, Lachin was telling me that when they got here, this is what it looked like. So you can see you know, a bunch of rubble all around here and big piles of dirt. And uh, he and his team, uh, again, have done a lot of work here to help restore this fort. Okay, we're now entering into the kitchen. Obviously, you have a lot of men. They all need to eat. Uh, so this would have been the place where all of the food was prepared. And beneath this area, as a matter of fact, if we were to lift up those boards right there. Um, there's a, like a tank, a water tank um, below the kitchen that would have provided water uh, for cooking. And then if we go in here, well, that water supply also uh, provided water for the bathroom as well. So this was most likely the officer's bathroom. And then over here, uh, not quite as nice as the officer's bathroom. Uh, this was the bathroom for the enlisted men. All right, we're moving more into the interior of the fort here. And uh, one thing that is, is kind of interesting is that there were no doors on this part of the fort. This kind of makes a, a ring around and um, was open. And there are a couple of ventilation shafts. And uh, this is one of them right here. So if we were to go in here and then take a look up, well, that's to help with uh, airflow through the fort and to help keep it cool. All right, continuing on back around here. Uh, so through this door right here, that's the, the kitchen where we just were uh, a minute ago. And you can see these hooks hanging here. Uh, this was probably for meat storage. So again, another one of the reasons that you wanna keep this place cool other than, you know, for the comfort of the soldiers, is also uh, for basically keeping meat cool. And up above here, probably storage of dry goods. Yeah, this is very, very interesting. All right, continuing with our walk through the fort here. Um, you know, in the 1800s, they didn't have electricity in the fort so what they would have to do and this is pretty interesting is rather than building the ceiling all the way to the wall they would leave a gap and there would be a chimney up there that would allow light oh man something has got the dog stirred up uh but they would uh 
have a chimney at the top that would allow light to reach the interior. And if we look here, there at the top, you can see the last remaining chimney uh, here at the fort. The rest have collapsed and fallen in. Okay, I'm gonna go upstairs now. Going to have to get a little bit creative on how we get past this spot. All right. Oh, we've got a door here that is acting as our floor. These original stairs. Oh, this is part of the original stairs. Yes, I believe. Oh, okay. Dog, what got yeah, you stirred up? <laughs> Here's another closer look at that chimney. Uh, we've come up a level, so it's a little bit easier to see. And uh, you can tell that there's some wood that is overlaid there. Well, if the fort was, you know, at risk of being bombarded, uh, they would go up there and they would cover this chimney up with wood and then put stones on top to protect the interior. But at other times it would provide light. All right, continuing our walk through the fort here, and this place is just cool as heck, and I'm really learning a lot. Uh, this room that we just entered into is the sleeping quarters for the soldiers who would have been garrisoned here. All right, so I'm just going to kind of walk through and repeat a few of the things that, that I just learned uh, about the sleeping quarters, which is really, really interesting. So there would have been about 44 men that would have been in each one of these rooms. And if you look at these brackets that are sticking out from the wall, these right here, well, that's what would have supported the beds. So the beds would have come out lengthwise right here. Uh, you'd have a couple guys above, a couple guys below. Uh, this little port here provided ventilation to the room. Uh, at the end of the bed, there would be a little table that would fold out and uh, you know, a couple guys could get around it and eat their meal. So there's not a dining hall or a dining room. Uh, they sleep in here and they also eat in here. Uh, these little brackets right here uh, provided a spot where um, basically there was an apparatus that hung down right here where they could keep their personal effects. Uh, and then the stove for the room would have been right here to provide heat. But really the most interesting thing to me is right up here. Let me adjust my lighting. If you look, well, there was some plaster that was put over the, uh, the wall at some point, but beneath it, you can see some graffiti that some of the original soldiers, probably from the 1870s, uh, drew right here above the window. So it looks like maybe some floral work or something like that. But uh, anyway, yeah. That's an example of uh, what the sleeping and really eating quarters would have looked like right here in the fort. All right, so this room that we are walking into now was the uh, quarters for the commandant. So he had, of course, his own private room, got his fireplace there. Um, this wood, a lot of the stuff here in this fort, you know, has either decayed or has been, you know, taken, um, you know, over the years. Uh, the wood here in this floor is uh, original to 1875. But Here's where the Commandant stayed. All right, now next to the Commandant's room is uh, the Decision Room. So it makes sense that it would be right next to his room. Uh, kind of small, honestly. Uh, something that's interesting about this particular spot 
is that, um, let me get my lighting adjusted. If you look at this metal frame, this is the only one like it that is remaining in the fort. And this was to help protect the interior in the event of a bombardment of the fort. So you see these little, these little slots right here. Uh, they would have metal bars or iron bars that they would slide into each of these positions to, uh, to protect the interior. Yeah, all kinds of interesting little things here. Okay, we've moved past the soldiers' barracks, and uh, we're over here on the opposite end of the fort from the commandant's room, and it's a little bit of a mystery as to what this room was. Uh, maybe it was an office for the officers, maybe it was something for the engineers, maybe it was used for storage, we don't know. Now, when the Battle of Verdun kicks off, uh, Fort Regret was... Mm, fairly safe. It, it was, you know, far enough away from what was going on that there, there wasn't an immediate concern. But when the Germans crossed the Meuse River and uh, started approaching on the left bank, well, this fort, well, it got into firing range of German artillery. And if you look right here, you'll notice there's a stone ceiling, but right here in this spot, there's a concrete patch. Well, that's because one of the German artillery shells that was fired on Fort Regret uh, hit this spot and knocked a hole in the ceiling. Interesting. All right, we're getting ready to head back down now. Uh, now, I don't claim to be an architect or a construction guy or anything like that, but I'm going to go ahead and say that I don't think we're gonna be able to go down the staircase uh, right here. So we're, we're gonna go back the way we came. As you can see here, this is uh, room number 56, and it can hold 40 men. Uh, we just left the barracks in the other room, and uh, really, the construction is very similar in this sleeping quarters as well. Uh, you have these brackets on the walls that would hold the beds, uh, so again, you don't want men just on the interior. This is a fort, it has to be protected. So you want some here more towards the, the outer walls as well. And boy, listen to my voice. Uh, somebody who was in a room with a snorer uh, would have really had some trouble sleeping in here. All right, we're gonna continue walking down this corridor and show a few other things. Uh, so again, we're on a perimeter wall. So this would be a defensive position. So you can see this gun port here. Uh, I'll show another one here in a second, but you can see that it's open right now, creating a larger hole for ventilation. Um, here is where the kitchen for the perimeter would be. So they would prepare food here. And then again, soldiers would eat inside their room like I showed in the other barracks. Um, and then if I move up here, well, here you can see one of these steel swing doors that would be closed up, um, you know, if the fort was under attack. Um, of course, you know, if, if there's people on the outside who are firing on the inside, you don't want to make it easy for them, so you want to make the hole uh, a little bit smaller. Uh, and then if we look up here, now I'm not going to go up this ladder, but if you were to go up into that 
dark cavernous space. Uh, there's an observation post that is up there, a very small one. And then what we were looking at right here is the bathroom. We always like to go on bathroom tours whenever we're looking at places. Uh, now there are five stalls here that would accommodate, I think it's 160 men. Uh, but here's the deal. These wouldn't be used unless absolutely necessary. And when it would be necessary is during an attack. All of the times the soldiers would go outside and use an outdoor toilet. But if the fort is under attack, well, you don't want to go outside exposing yourself. I guess that can be taken a couple different ways. Uh, so the, the bathroom indoors would be used in an emergency situation if there was an attack on the outside. Yeah, so many little interesting things here. Oop. What'd you find, Doug? Here's another room along the outer wall of the inner part of the fort. And uh, right here uh, in this spot, there would have been like a, a large Gatling gun and then also a little bit of uh, light artillery right here that was designed to fire out of these windows uh, in case any Germans breached the outer wall or really any enemy breached the outer wall. And then right here, uh, these are areas where infantry would be defending the fort. So these longer windows uh, up here at the top would be for rifle fire. Uh, but say the enemy breached the outer wall and then they got right up to the wall. Well, this spot right here, you could roll a grenade out on them or, or fire down. Uh, on any enemy who uh, who got right up on the wall. Yeah, interesting construction there. walking through a corridor now uh, to where, again, if the fort was under attack, well, uh, soldiers could utilize this space. So here uh, you can see a place for like a, a gun rack. And then also they would have seats right here where soldiers could, uh, you know, catch a break if need be or set and wait, uh, you know, to, to be called up for an attack. Right now we're on the right side of the fort and uh, this is a, a casemate where a 75 millimeter gun would have been positioned. Uh, so you can see you know, this little track right here where you can traverse the gun to the right and left. Uh, there would be a, a fire room off to my left where they would be directing fire uh, for this gun team and uh, this was to protect the the flanks of the fort if we were to open up these metal doors right here well we would be overlooking uh, the the sacred way but yeah this is where uh, flank protection for the fort would have been all right let's get into some uh, weaponry here in the fort uh, what we're looking at is the lower part of a 75 millimeter gun turret. And you can see uh, up there is the fire room. We're, go we're gonna get to that in just a little bit. 
but this is all manually powered. There's, there's no electric power to this. So you see this hand crank here. Uh, you would have two men. Let me just move around here. You would have two men who were operating these hand cranks. There's one over here as well that would raise and lower this turret. It would take five seconds to go up and five seconds to go down. Uh, on the second floor here is where the loader would be. So the shells would be loaded uh, here in that spot. And then uh, let me see if I can see that spot up here again. Uh, if you look right up in this area, um, so this tube that's coming down, uh, this is where the, uh, the shells would be loaded up. And uh, there was also a tube that caught the empty shell casings and they would fall out right here in a bag on the floor. Uh, now, here's something else that's pretty wild about this. There's no electricity in here. So if you look at this little bracket right here, well, that would hold a candle. Here's one over here that would hold a candle. And then all of the walls would be painted white to, uh, to reflect the light. But yeah, that's the lower part of the 75 millimeter gun turret. a tunnel now that is going below the fort and uh, we're going to pop up on another side here. Can't really see too much of where we just were. But uh, anyway, uh, looking to go up to the fire room of uh, one of these big guns. <laughs> okay, so Back around here uh, to actually this is a different turret uh, so here is the bottom level much like the one that we just looked at and then this one we have some access to the second level and also uh, actually up in the fire room so I'm gonna go ahead and scoot up these steps Ooh. I don't like that one. We're going to skip that step. All right. All right, up here on the second level now. All right, we just got up here on the second level of the turret. And this little alcove that we're looking at right here is where ammunition storage would be. So they might have high explosive shells, they might have shrapnel, you know, whatever. And then the loader would uh, grab his round. This would be kind of like a preparation tray right here. And then would load up the round in this tube. And then it would go up into the fire room. All right, so we're gonna go up into the fire room now. We're going to try and avoid falling through the dadgum floor in the process. And uh, yeah, here, hang on a second. Let me just make sure that I'm stepping in the right places. <laughs> this feels a little bit dodgy. Okay. Okay, anyway, heading up to the fire room now. Okay, had to shut off the camera for a second to get up here into the fire room because the quarters are a little bit tight. Uh, but anyway, going to explain just, uh, whoops, I'm already bumping stuff here. Going to explain uh, just how things worked up here in the fire room. All right, now again, we've got really tight quarters here, so you'll have to kind of work with me. Uh, but th there would be a three-man team up here in this gun turret. So right here in this spot would be a man who would operate the traversing mechanism 
that would traverse the guns to the right and left. And then right here where the guns are at, well, you'd have a man on each side who would act as a loader. Uh, after the gun fired, the empty shell would kick back and would go uh, down this hole right here. Um, but man, I can't even imagine how loud it must have been operating one of these things. These guys were probably deaf uh, by the time they were old men. Oh, and I said that, that the, it was a three-man team. Uh, well, it would actually be three men and the occasional bat. All right, we have uh, emerged from the darkness and now we are up on top of the fort. Uh, we'll, we'll get to the, the big guns here in just a second, but I wanted to show this real quick. When this fort was designed and added onto, uh, this was included to be a place where infantry could fire their rifles from uh, in, in case you know the enemy got too close. But anyway, we're gonna take a look at these gun turrets here. All right, now before we go, I wanted to come up here and uh, take a look at the outside of the 75 millimeter gun turret that we were looking at down below. So this is the exact gun turret that we were just in, where we were in the fire room. And well, trees are obstructing our view a little bit and the gun is pointed in the wrong direction. But uh, out here in front is the area where this gun would have covered. And by the way, the, just the shell on this thing is 50 tons, which is crazy to me. And then if we look right here, now this is an observation turret where people could climb up a ladder, get inside this thing, and then basically serve as spotters for the fire team to uh, make sure that they were on target. Yeah, this place has been fascinating. Okay, while I was uh, playing around at the 75 millimeter gun turret, uh, the rest of the crew went to another part of the fort and I'm catching up. Uh, the, the team that has restored this fort has also restored one of the machine gun turrets and have it to where it's fully operational. Uh, anyway, we're going to take a look at that now. Battery! Whoa, Well, that's pretty cool. <laughs> wow. <laughs> the only one which can go up, down, and turn. There is many other which can turn, but it's the only one which can up and down. That is cool. It's a number 45, this one. So we just saw the machine gun turret and uh, saw it operating from the outside. So uh, we've come back down below. Uh, my headlamp is still working, but my camera light keeps going in and out. Uh, but we're gonna take a look at how the machine gun turret operates. This is what we're looking at, like a big counterweight system. And then the, uh, the machine gun crew would be up there. Ready? Ok, 
Okay. So which one we get on that way? This side. Take speed. Yes, good. Is it actually doing anything? Stop. That's good. So. Oh. Okay. Oh, it's gone out. Yes. I didn't know I was doing that, eh? so I worked that. <laughs> I'll go in to show you how yeah. it was. Why nobody? So the fireman is in this place. Jesus. The two machine guns are yeah. here, one shoot, one refreshing. And for the rotation, it's uh, the shooter with, the, with his oh, hips, strange. which wow. make the turret turn. She's from 1905, so she's uh, 150, yeah. 115 years old. Well, that was uh, pretty dang cool. Uh, and it really, I mean, the, the history and all that stuff is, is very interesting to me. What, what I really love is that there are a group of people who were passionate about the history of this place and have really taken the time uh, out of their own schedules and money and everything like that to invest in preserving the history because this was, I don't know, kind of a, a lost place uh, for a while, but now it's, it's being restored. But anyway, uh, that was a little bit here at uh, Fort Regret along the Sacred Way. <laughs>